Is there ice on Antarctica's chest bone? Or is there no ice on Antarctica's chest bone? Or are we just talking Australia? And this is Preston John installment number 93, my knock. Allow wah. All praise our creator, our most high over everything. All praise Hawa for all this drop. You know what I'm saying? That all of us are digging on. I'm going to get your comments because I got to share it because it's just popping off. We've had, we're having more fun than we've had, you know what I'm saying, since them balcony days searching for the Presta, and we're doing it easily. So just watch how we flow, man. All praise to why. Anaga, is there ice on Antarctica's chest bone? Or is there no ice? I mean, you know, what's going on with this ice age, man? We've been digging on it, go get the drops. This little ice age that they're saying popped off after 1300 and, you know, went all the way up into 1800s, 19th century. And so when they talk about global warming, yeah, we got to warm up out this ice age. That's a natural process to warm up out of the ice age. They say, oh, it's getting warmer every year. It's getting warmer every year. CO2 emissions. We need to have climate change meetings because if it keeps getting warmer, we don't know if we'll be able to survive. Not the indigenous Naga, because, you know, say <laughs> your melanin, you about to, you know, be, you know, fully charged up, you know, fully charged up. But they're holding climate change meetings because they don't know if they'll survive the so-called radiation. The power of Hawa's luminary that they call the sun, or in the book of Enoch, he just calls it Tomas. <laughs> All right, man, so Australia's is Antarctica. Just keep that in mind. We're talking Terra de Fuego. That's land of fire, my nagi. That's not the land of ice. We ain't talking land of ice. We're talking Fuego. We're talking Australia, man. <laughs> I'm surfing the wave, man. I'm, you know, just enjoying that map pack, map pack. <laughs> With this uh, Antarctica, again, Tear de Fuego. I mean, you don't have some super cold climate when you talk Tear de Fuego. Managa, you got land of fire, land of dragons, however you want to say it. It got froze over. Like, did they put a spell on all our dragons, man? freeze them over for a time they always show that stuff in uh, transformers and metatron <laughs> megatron metatron comes out of nowhere after being frozen you know it's some hyper you know you know whatever chamber hyperbaric chamber <laughs> or under the under the the ocean ice shells and then he pops back up we talked to we talked suspended animation with Preston john this map is from 1520 man and there ain't no cap on an Arctic's chest bone, is all we say. Yeah, man. No cap. Oh, yeah, it's a great map of South America. But again, man, 1500s. <laughs> ain't no cap on an Arctic's chest bone. No cap, man. All right. <laughs> so what is popping with this little ice age, man? And why is Australia called Antarctica? Or should I say Antarctica is called Australia? Let's go. Originally, it was applied to the South Polar region. I'm, not, I'm talking about the name Australia in Wikipedia. We're reading. Originally, it was applied to the South Polar continent 
or sixth continent now known as Antarctica. The name is shortened form of Tierra Australis, which was one of the names given to the imagined landmass that was thought to surround the South Pole. or surround the whole entire earth plane <laughs> or at least our earth pond the earliest known use of the name australia in latin was 1545 when the word appears in a woodcut illustration of the globe titled sphere of the winds contained in an astrological textbook published in frankfurt in the 19th century the name Australia was reassigned to New Holland, the fifth continent, New Holland. Therefore, thereafter, the South Pole, polar continent remained nameless for some 80 years until the new name of Antarctica was invented. And now it's a fact, right? Started as a fancy, but now it's a fact. Okay. So to stop it right there, we clearly see that Australia is Antarctica. Maybe not, you know, or even the continent of Australia today probably was definitely connected, you know what I'm saying, to, um, you know, what they call Antarctica. But I'm saying Antarctica as a whole just comes from this name Australia, which means what? Down under, right? Or what? meaning southern man southern man okay hold on to your boot bones we about to go in and we about to go in heavy and we're going to do it quickly so just hold on to your boot bones for real for real remember i told you to hold on to your boot bones when your boots come flying off i told you to hold on to your boot bones man because the drop man is all the way up the water to you Allah, why? Praise the why, man. Let's go. Australia means southern. Got it. You know, Australia. It means southern, you know. <laughs> so when we talk Australia, don't think about the continent of Australia today. Think about Antarctica, man. Okay? I'm doing all this to preface some major weight. Is we gonna get very, very heavyweight, super heavyweight. Love to the bro five eyes ma. And we coming in high five eyes, ma. I'm just I'm just clearing the clearing the channels for you so you can take over the stream, man. Right? Cause it's all happening. We missing vibrations and we gaining vibrations. But here Antarctica is missing the ice on his cap, <laughs> missing the cap on his chest bone, the ice cap. And then, you know, suddenly it gained a cap, you know what I'm saying? Like, but there ain't no cap on Antarctica, I mean, Australia's chest bone. So when we talk Australia, think Antarctica, man. All right? Think Antarctica. Let's go. <laughs> this is amazing. Now, a lot of this comes from uh, uh, the Eli Yahoo uh, blog spot that was taken down. Um, I believe we got a PDF of it. I got to look for, I think it's on one of the packs, you know what I'm saying? I definitely got a print out of it, but this contains a lot of the similar, a lot of similar information, if not exact, you know what I'm saying? It could be a copy of it. So, you know, shout out to E, Eli Yahoo Project Blogspot. And I think this might just be like a, a uh, you know, a cutout, you know what I'm saying, of that particular joint. So shout out to him and shout out to Pontificates for even having this joint because we just about to talk Australia and we about to go in bone, in bone, man. Let's go. Okay. Oh, man, so many places to begin, you know. I, I guess we'll start right here. <laughs> Portuguese sailors first sighted Antarctica in 1488, 
which was about 40 years before the ice cover Antarctica. In the book, The Amazons by Guy Cadogan, C-A-D-O-G-A-N, Rothery, R-O-T-H-E-R-Y, about the Amazons, it states, while we find the early Portuguese voyagers and their competitors placing a colony of these women in Sacatria or some island or islands off the southeast coast of Africa, Marco Polo, the Venetian traveler who wrote late in the 13th century, tells us of certain dual islands off the coast of India. He says, quote, when you leave this kingdom of Kesma Koran or Makran, which is on the mainland, you go by sea some 500 miles towards the south, and then you find the two islands, male and female, lying about 30 miles distant from one another. The people are all baptized Christians. I'll stop the hype. See, they had to write this stuff fit. You know what I'm saying? But if these people were baptized Christians, then you wouldn't have came and tried to colonize them. You can't be hijacking Christian lands, right? But maintain the ordinances of the new, of the old time. <laughs> Come on, man. Body, man. <laughs> How are they going to be Christians, but maintain the ordinances of the Old Testament? When the Christians ain't keeping the Shabbat, no power before they power, that means they ain't calling on no JC, man. Praise JC, man. Son is the father, man. They ain't doing that. They maintain the code of the Tanakh. So whatever these Christians you're calling them, maybe we're back to talking about Nestorians, but let's go. Thus, when their wives are with child, they never go near them till their confinement and for 40 days thereafter in the island however which is called male dwell the men alone without their wives or any other women oh man that's that's called uh rikers island man you know what i'm saying <laughs> every year when the month of march arrives the men all set out for the other island <laughs> and tarry there for three months now, this kind of reminds me a little bit of the Presta flow, how he and Queen Sheba will come together, you know, you know, just to pop off, you know what I'm saying? So we're talking Khalifa. We're going to talk Khalifa, but let's go. So when the month of March arrives, the men all set out for the other island and tarry there for three months to wit, March, April, May, dwelling there, their wives for that space. At the end of those three months, they return to their own island and pursue their husbandry and trade for another nine months. So whatever they train in that, they train. And then they come hang with their wives for three months and they go back. As for the children, which their wives bear them, if they be girls, they abide with their mothers. But if they're boys, their mothers bring them up till they are 14 and then send them to their fathers. Such is the custom of the two islands. We're talking Amazons. We're talking Australia. And remember, Australia is Antarctica. Okay? Because <laughs> Australia means Southern. Let's go. Originally, it was applied to the South Polar Continent. We're talking Australia. Originally applied to the South Polar Continent. We're just talking Australia, boss, now known as Antarctica. But we're just talking Australia, boss, okay? Let's go. <laughs> so this is, again, you know, a takeoff of like Sheba, Solomon, you know what I'm saying, and how these high Amazon queens are popping off, you know what I mean? Let's go. Let's go. Because <laughs> I've been looking for this high Amazon queen link because I got to link in the high Amazon queen. We're talking our queens and our aquas, you know what I mean? Consistently in this press to flow. Consistently, man, because it's all connected. When we talk King David, we got to talk Lady Davida. You know what I'm saying? Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, man. I think we're seeing clearly. 
Let's go, man. So such is the custom of the two islands. The wives do nothing but nurse their children and gather such fruit as their island produces for their husbands to furnish them with all necessities, all of which offer a striking contrast to the social economy usually attributed to the Amazons. Instead of the women being trained and equipped for warfare, we have a peace organization so that the whole appears to us little more than an exaggeration of common facts. We are told that these people lived on flesh and rice, that there was plenty of amber grease cast up on shores. Whoa. Remember the amber grease drop? Our wave surfers know exactly what we're talking about. Now we're talking that dragon spittle. Because in China, they call amber grease dragon spittle, dragon spit. And it had all these cure, curative properties, healthy properties of amber grease. Then they started connecting it with whales. And we said, well, they like to cover the whale, cover the dragon with the whale. You know, Moby Dick was originally about a dragon and not a whale, you know what I'm saying? So we're talking Leviathan. Well, let's go. So they had the amber grease dragon spittle and that the men were excellent fishers. Moreover, they that dwelt in islands far from the mainland now under such conditions as these in a small community, the men would probably be away from home at regular seasons for months together pursuing their avocations of rice cultivation, fishing, and barter. And then the home island would be populated chiefly, if not entirely, by women and children. So they were just managing their island space, man, you know, island here, island there, and let's go. But all connected. So we got the women and children over here, and then we popping off, and you know what I'm saying, getting our uh, husbandry on and are training in over here. Let's go. Now it says added to this possible, a possible adherence to Old Testament law. Marco Polo says that the islands had a bishop who was subject to the Archbishop of Socotra, whose Christian would no doubt be somewhat akin to that of the cops or C-O-P-T-S or some analogous heathen custom and we have a perfectly comprehensible explanation of the story. So all that is conjecture, right? <laughs> all we know is that they had an Old Testament law, man. So they are code keeping, you know what I mean? At least, you know, we're seeing a, a foundation of code keeping, whether they went off later, which we know the Nagas went off later, you know, after David got the order back, we know his his sons went to war and all that was going on, right? Solomon had to go to war with was Absalom. And I mean, all this was going on, you know what I'm saying? So um yeah, Solomon and Absalom, was it uh was it David and Absalom, his son when the kingdom was being divided, but then Solomon later wanted to claim it, the title of the sons of David went in, you know, the ex larks went in is all we know. Now, this <laughs> Old Testament law, this code keeping, is already here. The island, which is southeast of Africa, is Antarctica. Was it from here that Palomi Tommy originally? came via Australia and the East to Europe and Spain. Whoa. No one really talks about being from Antarctica or Australia, right? No one really talks about people being from here, but, you know, we see that people were here popping off. We see that it was popping off in Antarctica or Australia, right? So let's go. Was Palomi or Tami originally came via Australia? Was she originally from Australia? 
and the east to Europe and Spain, the island south of India, 500 miles would seem to be where the Maldives are today. The Cagos Island may be where the island of Scotia, Scotia, with its Jewish Christians, <laughs> but they don't want to say Hebrew, Israelites, right? So indigenous cause, right? It would seem that the population of Scotia moved to the present islands of Socotra off the coast of Africa and part of Yemen. It would seem that the RO or O mitochondrial DNA of the Amazon Queens is to this day found among the women of this island. It would seem that these Amazon islands are a colony from Antarctica. Now we about to talk little ice age. <laughs> you know, I brought it up for a reason. Because as soon as we start talking about little ice age, things start to connect, man. Global warming is just the end of an ice age. And the ice age wasn't so little if it froze over Antarctica, man. You're gonna you want to drop that little title. Call it Big Boy Ice Age, man. You know what I'm saying? Because it froze Antarctica, Jack. Because there wasn't no cap on Antarctica's chest bone. I mean, you know. We're just talking about Australia <laughs> or Terra de Fuego. There was no cap on Antarctica's chest bone. Now they just call Amazon Islands a colony from Antarctica, which brings up this mother country, you know, type of vibe, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, a connection, you know, that, you know, might be what all these vortexes are really popping off about. It is now easy due to Google Earth to see all these submerged Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean lands, which prove the validity of the original accounts of Polo, Manderville, and Odorique. Antarctica was almost an island in the period before 1530. Antarctica was almost an island in the period before 1530, except that it was only separated from the southern tip of South America by a river. It would seem that the Amazon men lived on the South American side of the river and the women on the Antarctica. Whoa. Managa, we are popping off. Off, man. <laughs> Should I say we popping on? We, we popping on, man. We, <laughs> we coming back online, you know what I'm saying? Because, whoa, okay. Okay. Just think about the Sheba Solomon flow, man, because we're going to talk Sheba. Now let's go. So Antarctica was almost an island in the period before 1530. So I guess he's saying like there was almost a separation except that there was a river that connected it, all right? It would seem that the Amazon men lived on one side of the river and the women lived on the Antarctica side, all right? Mandeville writes, this is John Mandeville. This land of Amazonia is an island all in environed with the sea save in two places where be two entries. And beyond that water dwell the men that be their paramours and their loves, where they go to solace them when they will. So check it, after the cataclysmic events around 1400 BC, the high Amazon queens, the Amazon, the high queens, fled Australia, which they put in parentheses, moved for a time and settled in the Antarctica. But we know <laughs> that when we talk Antarctica, we're talking Australia.
So they didn't have to flee <laughs> out of Australia. They're just trying to, they can't, you know what I mean? They're giving you a lot of clues, you know, but you're going to have to, you know what I mean? Get these maps out, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so, you know, what they call Antarctica today was Australia. All right, the whole thing, man. Let's go. Going quickly, let's go. <laughs> so the legendary priestesses of Diana. Now you're getting into the high queens. And now you're getting into the Wonder Woman vibe of the Amazon. So you're connecting it. Antarctica with the Amazon high queen with the Wonder Woman, both of them named Diana. Huh. Just a thought, man. Just a thought, man. And you know, this name be popping up in the script, right? Dinah was the seventh child and daughter of Leah and Jacob. Right, didn't this whole war pop off around Dinah? You know what I'm saying? They say her name means judged or vindicated. One of the patriarchs of the Israelites. So she's one of the patriarchs. This Dinah is one of the patriarchs, man. <laughs> I, I'm just showing you what's already there. We don't got to go into fandom and Marvel and comic books, but they're taking our story. Right now, now she's Wonder Woman, and you're not connecting her with Antarctica. You know, some are connecting it with the Amazons, and then here comes the Queen Khalifa flow. Right, here comes the Queen Sheba flow. I'm talking high Amazon queens. I'm talking high Antarctica queens. But Antarctica is a new word, right? They just made that crap up, right? Therefore, the South Polar continent remained nameless for some 80 years until the new name of Antarctica was invented. My naga, invented, my naga. Antarctica was invented because we still talk in Australia. We still talk in Australia. You know what I'm saying? This ain't no play play. <laughs> all right, all right. So Dinah is one of the, you know, patriarchs, right? She's, she's the sister of Judah, right? She's the sister of uh, Benjamin and, and Levi, right? She, she's the sister. She's one of the sisters of these 12, you know, tribes. You know what I'm saying? I mean, she's one of the sisters, but we don't hear a lot about her. But there's this whole situation about her being raped. And is that, uh, you know, a metaphor for something else? But in this story, they go, <laughs> they go get that vindication. You know what I'm saying? The, the bros team up in super superhero fashion, you know what I'm saying? And pop off on the whole city, you know what I mean? So go get that drop. But I just wanted to confirm that when they talk Dinah, we're talking Dinah. Diana, Diana. <laughs> Told you, man, hold on to your, remember when I said to remember that I'm telling you to hold on to your boot bones? This is that moment, one of the moments where I'm going to remind you that I told you to hold on to your boot bones. We're talking Antarctica, Australia. We're about to go into Joshua. And just, you know, connect some stuff, man. You know, talk about, you know, whooping up on these hijacks and why the hijack might be so mad. And what kind of spells are going on with these harmonics, with this temple of harmonics. 
what's going on between this, what's going on between the, the so-called little ice age. Uh, one of my Nagas left a comment that, that that big holy mountain of harmonics is in a sense, a, a giant harp, whether, <laughs> whether, you know, uh, control manipulation, you know, geo, you know, I mean? geo engineer, whatever, <clears throat> you know what I mean? Just the technology has already been here for weather manipulation. But let's go. <laughs> I told you, hold on to your boot bone. We just popping off. Press the 93. I got y'all. Let me get my water, man. About to do some good reading on your head bone. On your ear bone. <clears throat> wow, let's go. So let's connect the little ice age with Australia, with Antarctica, with Dinah, the sister of the patriarchs of Israel. You know what I'm saying? Can't make this up. So Dinah's over here popping off. After the cataclysmic events around 1400 BC, the high queens fled Australia, moved for a time, settled in Antarctica, which is, you know, really like going from, you know, one area to another area of Australia. You know what I'm saying? It's all Australia. It's no ice. It ain't no ice. All right. It ain't no ice. the legendary priestesses of Diana. So these are the priestesses of Dinah, right? Who came from the island island, and their ships in the events of 1538 AD. The last of the high queens of Antarctica fled with some survivors back to Australia under the leadership of Queen Dini. All right, D-I-N-I, -I. interesting, right? So they went from 1400 BC to when some cataclysms going on and they, they fled to, from Australia to Antarctica, okay? Or they say move. So that's still not talking about the Australian continent specifically as today, you know, move. Now you're talking about Lemuria, you know, you're talking about a big, giant, giant continent, not the little Australia today. So they fled from Mu. They fled from ancient Mu, you know, in the Pacific um, to Antarctica. Remember, we got that Tara Sancta drop that had the Holy Land, Tara Sancta, written right there in Antarctica, man. So just keep all that in play. Keep it all in play. Because why would it say Holy Land in Antarctica? If there wasn't some, you know, holiness going on, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so Dinah came from this island and in in the priestesses of Dinah came to, the, to this island in the ships in the events of 1530. All right, so now we got this ice age going, popping off another cataclysm. All right, so they went from cataclysm to cataclysm. The last of the high queens of Antarctica fled with some survivors back to Australia under their leadership of Queen Dini. Rothery writes, Sir John Mandeville, who looms large in the company of quaint Rocanteers, Rock wrote of the Amazons as of an existing nation in his day and says, among a plethora of other things that they kept the lost 10 tribes of Israel shut up in a valley surrounded by mountains. Well, now we're talking about the San Banyan River and being beyond that river, you know what I'm saying? You know, um, it, it was protecting or it was exiling, you know, 10 of the tribes or, you know, however many tribes were being in exile beyond the San Banyan. So, 
when they say that there was a river connecting, you know what I'm saying, uh, Antarctica, you know, with South America, you know, is that the connecting river? Are we just talking to San Benyan? Are we getting a hard hit <laughs> on where the San Benyan could be located? Some connection point between Antarctica and South America, maybe, maybe. Okay. So John Mandeville is talking about the Amazons <laughs> keeping the lost 10 tribes of Israel shut up in a valley surrounded by mountains. This refers to the Amazon territory in Australia. So while we're doing this, right, we got to break the spell. We've been brainwashed. This is why we're doing this. All right. Australia is Antarctica. Australia is the South Polar Continent. Okay. Australia is the South Polar Continent. Ka, ka, okay. <laughs> This refers to the Amazon territory in Australia, Antarctica. Sheba, right? We talk Joktan and Joktan's family, and you get this Sheba popping off. Or excuse me, you know, uh, we talking, uh, who's that, Ashur? Or uh, let me get it right. No, nah, yeah, I think it was Jock Town. Let me just check. Let me check. Let me check. Right. Younger son of Eber, Jock Town, progenitor of the 13 Arabic tribes. They're just talking about Arab proper. Arab proper. <laughs> Legendary form of the tradition that Katan. Kara Katan, press the job progenitor of the southern arabs not what you think of today but we're talking arab proper the original sarah's sons sarah's sons like abraham and sarah you know <laughs> while the ishmaelite arabs were originally of non-arabic stock they are not true arabs they are pretending to be arabs they adopted arab customs but the Arab customs were the proper and the proper were, you know, those that were in code. So Joktan's coming out of Hebrew where you're getting the Hebrew. I mean, this is the proper, the Hebrew code, the Hebrew, you know, uh, seed, inheritance, heritage of Hawa, whether we're talking, you know, Eber, all the way through Abraham, back to Shem, back to Noah, you know what I'm saying? So let's go. Remember that you got Arab pretenders and Arab proper, man. And out of Joktan comes Sheba and Ophir and Havala. And all these are linked to gold. Ain't that crazy? Ain't that crazy? But Jock Tom, man, you're just talking Yucatan, Mexico. <laughs> Back to the California gold, all that in between. So these are hard hits, man, as to what we're talking about and where we're at. And we cash nothing number of receipts, man. All right. We're talking Dinah, <laughs> which is one of the 12 lost tribes. You know, one of the 12, you know, she's she's the sister that they've, you know, went to war for, man, that they love. So this refers to the Amazon territory in Antarctica, Sheba, Thebes, right? This is where you're getting the Thebes, and they also connect with Heber. But we know that Heber is her granddaddy, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
another group of Amazons had left Australia with the tribes of Manasseh, Dan, Reuben, and there are a council left Australia with the tribes of Manasseh, Dan, and Reuben, my daughter. I know. We're going to wrap our head bone around it. I know. So they are already positioned in Antarctica, which is why that, you know what I mean? Um, that uh, Taurus Sancta, you know, flow was so important, man. I wonder if we get over here right quick. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because Uncle Sam came and, you know, we're talking over. We're going to talk some more of that Philippine flow. For sure, for sure, you know. But yeah, he came to the Nagas in Cuba, in Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Philippines. <laughs> Look at this Indian chief back here, all, all docile, reading along, getting indoctrinated. Another Indian washing the windows. And all these Indians right here being told what time it is. Huh? Wow. School begins, it says. Hold up, man. Hey, out to my knocker surfing away in the drop, drop, chatter, chat to chat, chat. my bro, Melvin Trey Coger be popping off, man. Caramel dropping some pressure. Shout out to Cootie Mayo. You'll see how much, you know, you can do a beautiful dance, a beautiful tango, you know what I'm saying? In these classrooms, man, we're talking drop nation. It's amazing how everything go back to the Davidic line and somebody taking the title, man. That's, that's big facts. Melvin Trey got the drop, man, real time. Man, Con Fat, stay dropping drop, man. What you got over here, Con? Okay, view of the Hebrews. Con, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is going to solidify a lot of things, too. Back to the Tacoma safe flow. This is dope, man. This is dope. It's a good drop right here. You never know what, you know, drops going to be dropping off and the drop, drop, chatter, chat, 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 chatter. Yeah, I mean, everyone's saying that these Nagas here had one power. They say the great Yahweh, we're talking Hawa, whom they call the great bene beneficent, supreme, and Holy Spirit who dwells above the clouds and who dwells with good people and is the only object of worship. That's cold keeping, man. Most high over everything. Yeah, man. He speaks of a preacher's being among the Indians at the South before the American Revolution and beginning to inform them that there is a God who created all things upon which they indignantly reply go about your business you fool do not we know there is a god as well as you <laughs> get out of here with that man <laughs> we already got the most high over everything man. hey hallelujah yahuwah that's halal halal you luya is halal hawa right <laughs> Before you need to add anything to your breath and your security, man. Yeah, you know I mean, hey, we seeing clearly, man. Yeah, that's dope, man. I'm, I'm over here popping up. Hey, uh, Con Fat, man, I appreciate you, man. I'm going quickly. Hey, love to EC. Always drop and drop. You got Egyptian mummy trap going down, going all the way up, man. Con Fat popping off. All right. Melvin, man, what it do, man? Big Ten, what it do, man? I'm just looking for this Tar Sanctum map. There we go. There we go. Hey, the drop chatter is popping off, man. So, Managa, this is Australia, right? <laughs> Tar Sanctum means holy land. Remember that? So, when they talk to Tar Sanctum, they got retreats in Israel today. You got everything happening.
Holy land, man. All right. <laughs> Tara sunk. Holy land. Holy land. The region where most biblical events took place. Now, this is stretching my mind bone, man, as I'm digging on it. Because why in the world would Tara Sancta be in Antarctica? Antarctica is a new word they just invented. Why in the world would Tara Sancta man? He's talking Australia's. But in Australia's is holy land. And this is why we're getting <laughs> just drop after drop, receipts after receipts. That Tara Santa, holy land, is already here. That they're renaming it. but it's already here. And look how big it is. Look how big it is, right? <laughs> I mean, Africa, Taurus, so when they say you got to come from Africa, you Negro, you say, what about Taurus, Santa? What about Australia's, right? <laughs> Shout out to my Aboriginal cons in Australia. What about Taurus, Santa? Because all this is Australia's. Phoenicia, we seen it all down here. And we got gateways that push right through. And there's no cap on Antarctica's chest ball, but let go. Con, con. So Tara Sancta, Holy Land, Australia, Antarctica, same thing. Tara Sancta, Holy Land, Australia, Antarctica, same thing. And when they say that there's a river, that connects Australia's with South America. This must be a situation right around here. But where is it today? Man, let's go. I mean, how many people just walk over to Antarctica from Chile? You know what I'm saying? But at one time in 1607, it was connected. Is this where the San Manuel River is? This refers to the Amazon territory in Australia or Sheba or Eber or Cavera. Another group of Amazons left Australia with the tribes of Manasseh, Dan, and Reuben. So the tribes of Israel were already in Australia. Or we're just talking Tara Sancta or Holy Land. <laughs> wow. And they had to migrate or, or because of some cataclysm. Is that the freezing over little ice age situation? I don't you know. I'm just, I don't know. And there are accounts of these warrior women in the 17th and 18th centuries in the Caucasus and other places. The Franciscan friar Orderic also writes of Australia, which he visits around 1318. After visiting Keilon, C-E-Y-L-O-N, he traveled east across the river to the kingdom of Manse, where he also refers to as India or another India. Come on, man. Here we go, right, here we go. Another India. Preston John is the king of three Indias, right? So this was the Manessite kingdom in Northern Australia, Antarctica. He would later describe the inland kingdom of Gaudi or Kaudi, C-A-U-D-I. Hey, so, you know, let's just get it from here, man. I mean, <laughs> you see what we're dealing with? I said, man, I want to back up a little bit. This is, you know, look. <laughs> I know. We're just talking Australia. 
pre-ice though, right? They got a day 1530, which correlates, you know, with a lot of these 1500s maps with no ice. They're saying that these people got ordinances of the Old Testament <laughs> in Antarctica, and then we got a Tar Sancta Holy Land popping off in Antarctica. Okay, we're going quickly, but let's go. Like I said, Prest is the king of the three Indias, right? Same link. <laughs> so I just want to show you, this is all linking up. Prester John was both priest and king. Prester means priest, John means king. Priest, king, Prester John, who in the 12th century ruled over the three Indias. The first India was the place today we call India, Malabar, Bharat, and many lands to its north, both west and east. The second was the East Indies or Indonesia. And they don't know, man, because clearly they don't know. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> they're going to they're gonna say one India is what we call India today. The other is Indonesia, East Indies. And the third India was the great Australia. So we know that that's Antarctica. So we know what they're probably really looking like. Three Indias is like North America, South America, Antarctica flow. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, all vortex flow. You know what I'm saying? All vortex flow. Greater India, we know is India superior. So Preston John was a father of King David Soslin, Prince of Osi and Ephraim. <laughs> who married Queen Tamar. Tamar keep popping up, man. Tamar pops up and, you know, Dana every Preston John, you know, investigation, man. You know what I'm saying? You know, we're talking high Amazon queens. The Alexander connected with the story of Preston John. Roger hit Roger II. Jadaron of Chola was not Alexander the Great of Macedonia, but the Kalan ruler, Rajender, the great who became, or he's also Alexander Rajender. Okay, okay, hold up, hold up. <laughs> who became the ruler of the three Indies in the early 11th century. The name Chola was also written as solely or pronounced as solely. And if you look up David Sauslin back in that genie doc. Sauslin. We got to dig on that Sauslin title, man. Genie, man. Sure. Let's go. It pops right up for you. Exilarch. That means these are the Israelite cons, man, during Babylon, Babylonian captivity. So this is XLR David the Sixth Austin of Babylon. He's the son of Raja here, Raja Chola the Second Jadara, Emperor of Soli or Prestacha. <laughs> all right. And we connected all this stuff, even the Hanan situation. He's also called Kanan with a C. So we said choose your Canaan, because you know, not all Canaans are the same. He also will be called Cain as the son of Prester. So we have duplicity again. But specifically, they were talking about this David here. He's the father of Hasdai, and he's the brother of Solomon I, king of Telmes, and Hanan, king of Tahama. These are Hebrew Nagas, man. And his. Let's see. Let's check out Solomon. So he's the husband of Labana, Lemba, 
queen of Rubani, right? So here, so this brings us to the Rubani Gaudi's and Manis, man. She's the wife of Solomon, queen of Rubani Gaudi and Mani, or Ruben Gaudi and Manasseh, or you know what I'm saying, over these tribes, right? Okay. <laughs> So we're back to the high Amazon queens. So back to the Sheba Solomon flow. This could also be a title for Sheba. Limbu, queen of Rubadi, Gadi, Imani. These are these Antarctic situations popping off. This is this, you know, no cap on Antarctica's chest bone, Australia, that they're talking about here because this is Solomon, the brother of David Sauslin. And we were just talking about David Sauslin, right? Preston John was the father of King David Sauslin. Just like here, where his father is Preston John. Let's go. I mean, we're going real smooth into this, man. You see, you see, you see how we flow? Prince of O.C. and Ephraim. Ephraim, so... Whether it's Rubadi, Gadi, and Mani, or Ruben, Gad, and Manasseh, you know, you see all this uh, 12 tribes flow. The Alexander story, love to Aqua Tide, connecting that Copenhagen. We're going to get back on that Copen situation because, you know, that's connected back to the Dark Time flow. I'm saying, like, this is how fun it is right now to be surfing away, man. We, we just got so much happening. This Kofin flow. Jaktan's people, his descendants, <laughs> has given from Mesha. Ain't there some type of Mesha, uh, you know, stone Moab situation going on, right? So, you know, dwelling from Kofin or Kofin, an Indian river, and in part of Asia adjoining it. So we got a whole Kofin flow that Aqua Tai brought out. You know what I'm saying? That also connects to this coffin campaign. They just brought up Alexander over there, right? Right. But we're connecting it all here because we're talking Afghan, man. Afghan, Kyber, which is Kiber, which is Eber. They want to bring it to Pakistan. But nah, man, we right here in America and in India Superior because Afghan is the son of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is the son of King Saul and served in the court of David. This is why Alexander needed to capture a number of fortresses controlled by the local tribes. But we're just talking Kofin, right? <laughs> I quite tell you a genius for this, man. <laughs> And she dropped some gray drop, you know, connecting this coping, coping flow. You know, coping also connects to this color blue, you know what I mean? And she's just letting you know what it is, doing what it do, coping blue, coping blue, coping blue. Got it. Copenhagen, first town in Denmark. Okay. Okay formerly known as Munger's Mile, okay. Munger's Mile, okay, built in 1883. <laughs> yeah, that's in Wisconsin, but then they just say, Copenhagen is a town in Denmark and is northwest of Loy or Lowville. But it was formerly known as Munger's Mile. But Munger's Mile is on the Wisconsin River. <laughs> so we keep bringing it right back here. They keep talking about blue, coping blue. And there's a blue river tributary. Let's get it bigger. Tributary of the Red River in southern Oklahoma in the United States via the Red River. It is part of the watershed of the Mississippi River. Now we're back to the, to the now. They call it the Blue River, man. And the Blue River is the Copen, Copen Blue. Monaga, Copen Blue. 
And now we're talking Blue Rivers, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Blue Creek, Blue River. Wow. Top battle you with genius folks. And again, we're just talking COVID campaign, right? Because Jock Time was dwelling from Kofi and Indian River or Blue River. Top battle. You a genius for this. So we're just talking Katan, like the car of Katai. We're talking Arab proper, man. Not the pretenders. Arab proper. There's a difference, apparently, <laughs> that we all needed to know about. Let's get it back over here. <laughs> We're just popping off, man. Roger here, Roger Chola the second, the Pandya, press the job. They're bringing up Alexander the Great. Aguata is dropping that this Kofin campaign is happening right here. And now you can connect to Alexander, not of Macedonia, but of Colon. Ruler Rajender is Alexander, <laughs> the great who became ruler of the three Indies in the early 11th century. The name Chola is also written as Soli, like Solomon. Chola is Sola or Soli. Whoa. So the widespread influence of Christianity in India is often hidden in histories of India. The Krishna story is an Hinduized version of the Christ story, which was used as a way to encourage Christians to return to Hindu Hinduism in a Christian or Krishna form. The so-called Vaishnavism and Jain Jainism often covers over a Christian movement. The Christianity of Prester John was of was a form of Nestorian Christianity. And Nestorian refers to an old king renowned for wise counsel, right? So we're talking about a wise king like a Solomon, like a David, like a Preston that had enculturated itself in the Hindu culture and thought forms, okay. And we're just talking Preston John, man. So yeah, this link is crazy. You know, we've been in it way longer than I expected to, but I can keep going for probably 10 hours straight on this link, man, because, yeah, you know, they go into star forts and all kinds of things, man. Oh, man. Okay. We're going, you know, this, this investigation continues. Oh, man, so much dropping here. But, yeah, this, this investigation continues, so we'll be back. Going back and forth, definitely. I'm gonna keep this link up, and it's gonna be dropped, you know, right there on top of the links for Preston '93. You know what I'm saying? I'm just over here, just enjoying the flow with you, man. Ah, uh, so we keep hearing about this Cadado or Dodi. It says the Dodd family, which is found among many Aboriginal groups in Western Australia, South, South Australia, the North Territory, and Queensland, are the remnants of the descendants of the Davidic kings, kings of David, King David and them. The name Dodd coming from David or David or Daoud or Dodu. Some of the Afghans in Australia. <laughs> oh, man. And they walking right into this body bag. Some of the Afghans in Australia in the 19th century were returning remnants from the tribes who left in the 16th century for Afghanistan, Pakistan. Stop it. Stop it, man. Just cut it out, man. Just fall back for a minute, man. Because we know. According to the medieval empire of the Israelites, this is a $1,000 book. We got the PDF for you. We, we've been dropping it like, you know, like volcano fire. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> According to the legend, the rulers of Afghanistan are the 
the descendants of the ancient Israelites. Okay, so when they talk Afghanistan, they're still talking Israel because that's not the real Afghanistan. All right, <laughs> Afghan has nothing to do with the Middle East, so called. We're talking Israelites from the tribe of Benjamin. It is extremely revealing that this assertion was expressed only in the 17th century. That is after the breakup of the empire of the birth of Islam. So this is after the breakup of the empire, the Hebrew empire and the birth of Islam. So ain't it funny that in the 16th century during this ice age, while they are migrating on over here, right? <laughs> we are, we're breaking up and they're being born. I mean, let them tell it. They've always been popping off this Mohammedan tribes, but nah, Mohammedan tribes are not Islam. This religion was born <laughs> after your fall. Oh, man, I dodge all these hijacks. Man, you know what I'm saying? So when we really get that through our head, ball, our fall was their rise. Our fall was their rise. The adherents of this version maintain that King Saul had a son, Yeremau, or Jeremiah, who also had a son named Afghana. Jeremiah died approximately at the same time as his father, Shaul. Mm. Jeremiah died around the same time as King Saul. Afghana secured a high position in the rule of King David and remained at the royal court during the rule of Solomon. So Shalak, I keep saying, Jeremiah served in David's court. His son, Afghana, served in King David's court. But it's interesting that Jeremiah is popping off in Jeremiah 30 talking about King David, whom Hawa will rise again, you know what I'm saying? So... Jeremiah has a close affinity with David and Solomon, and that's why he's speaking on it as a prophet. And now we see why. We were talking about this Gurkhan and Gurchin, Jurchin, for hundreds of years later, during the troubles in, India, in Israel, the Afghan family resettled in the province of Gur, now the center of Afghanistan. They stayed here to live and went into trade. With the arrival of Islam, right, it's just arriving on these lands. Seven representatives of the Jews who lived in Gur, headed by their leader, Kish. Now, what they say before, they said, you know, Kish is the father of Saul. Kish, you got Kush, and you got Cash, because you know, Asher is also called Cash, which is very interesting. You know what I'm saying? Very interesting. So you got Kish, who, you know, get the last drop, is being called the father of King Saul. <laughs> yeah, King Saul. And then Saul has Jeremiah. Jeremiah has Afghan. You know, Afghan. He has a high position in, in the rule of King David. So he's high up with the Preston. Now they have Afghanistan, right? All right, so he remained at the, at the royal court during the rule of Solomon. 400 years later, during the troubles in Israel, the Afghan family resettled in the province of Gur, now the center of Afghanistan, Afghan, the son of Jeremiah, all right? They stayed here to live and went into trade with the arrival of Islam on these lands. Seven representatives of the Jews who lived in Gur, headed by their leader, Kish, appealed to the prophet Muhammad. So this is their story. I can't back it up. I'm just reading it. Let's put it together. So the prophet rewarded them. So 
Kish. Now, I don't know if this is the exact Kish that's supposed to be the father of King Saul, but it's very interesting if it is, right? Because Kish, would, which is also could be called Cash or Kush. Like I said, Asher is also being called Cash. You know, K-A-S-H is also Ash. Cash is Ash. All right. <laughs> so they're saying, uh, you know, all these lines are coming out of Kush, which are also coming out of Cash or Asher. You know what I'm saying? Such as Sheba and Ophir and Avilia. All right. So this Kish, which is also possibly the father of King Saul, they're saying appeals to the prophet Muhammad. Okay, the prophet rewards them and the Jewish name Kish was changed by Muhammad to the Arab Arashi. Now, we just got on these proper Arab propers, you know what I'm saying? And this whole jock time flow, all right, connecting with that. This Arashid flow. Matter of fact, let me check this out. Let's go back to the jock time flow. And when they, you know, talking about that gur, it's also this J U R, jur, hum. And this jur, hum, you know, could also be jur. Ham or Jerkan, you know what I mean? So Gurchin, Gurhun could all be the same thing as well. <laughs> you remember <laughs> they say that, you know, with these Mongols or these great ones, Jokta's descendants migrated eastward su suggested that Jokhtan is the progenitor, the father of these Mongols, these great ones, including East Asians and the indigenous peoples of America, with the Yucatan Peninsula <laughs> supposedly being named after Jokhtan. All right, I'm just connecting some of this uh, Jokhtan flow, man. But let's go. I mean, you see how this is, right? Because <laughs> we were we were just talking about David's and Dodi's and Dodas, but they keep talking Afghan on us, man. That's why we had to bring up Afghan, right? Afghan nah. in the you know court of King David and in the royal court of Solomon. So this Afghan, you know, was a very very high figure you know, right in the loins, basically, of of David and Solomon, right in the loins, you know what I'm saying, of, of, you know, these, you know, tribes coming straight out with the cold, you know, right in the loins of the cold keepers. So what we're seeing is the remnant, man, of so much of this flow, you know what I mean, that has already been here, is already protected, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're just now finding it. They're just now finding us. And we're just now popping off, man. <laughs> So Kish's name was changed to Arab Arashi. Afterwards, Arab Arashi received instructions to spread Islam among his people. Now I can't confirm or deny <laughs> that King Saul, you know what I'm saying, was coming out of this, you know, Arab Arashi flow, you know what I'm saying? But we know. That wouldn't make sense if Saul's son is Jeremiah, the Hebrew prophet prophesying about David returning, and his son Afghana is in the royal court during the rule of Solomon. So, you know, I mean, something ain't adding up, but, you know, Arab al Rashi definitely is a hard hit for us to really research thoroughly and find out who these Arab propers are. You know, when we hear about Arab proper, you know, and this whole Afghan flow connects directly to it. When we hear about Arab proper, man, the Arab proper connected with the Qatar, right? Jokta, 
who's coming out of Eber directly, Eberu. We're talking Sheba and Ophir, right? And Haveli. Let's go. Uh, let's go. And we got pretenders that are not of this Arab stock. So we're just talking about the Arab al Rashid flow. And is this the Arab proper flow? So just keep all that in mind. Let's keep it flowing. <laughs> yeah, man. So, yeah, this link right here is just going in bone, you know, on all these things. I want to just take it right. I mean, because I can keep going on this link. And I will, I will, you know, I will. Oh, man. You know what? Hold up, man. I just saw some more. <laughs> a little early. I'm just belly flopping for real now, man. Because, you know, I got, I got things to do, man. I got things to talk about. David Rubini right, is another connection, just like David Slauson. Heard about the Benjamin ruled kingdom in afghanistan they just belly flop right to the tribe that we just we just got this drop why would there be a benjamite benjamite ruled kingdom in afghanistan my naga maybe maybe because you're talking to tribal benjamin ancient israelites rulers in afghanistan the rulers of Afghanistan are the descendants of the ancient tribe of Benjamin. They just got that through King Saul and Jeremiah and Jeremiah, man. Which, you know, Afghan is popping off out of, right? So we're talking about the Benjamin rule kingdom of Afghanistan. So this link is connecting everything we're talking about, man. And he made an alliance with them and the remnants of his people moved into Asia. Which one? And they nominally at least embraced the Muslim faith. And here we go again <laughs> with this Mohammedan, you know, hijack, you know what I'm saying? Hijacking the children of Israel, man. Like it's always about the embracing this Muslim faith, right? It's always about converting. Muhammad, you know, gave him his name, changed his name to Al Rashid. <laughs> Talking Kish, the father of Saul. You know, is this why Israel had to get this course correction, had to get David, you know, anointed Khan? You know what I'm saying? We're talking Arab proper, though. And this is back to the Joshua flow, how, you know, we kept going off until their powers. We're going to get it quickly. The ancestors of the Khazars, tribes of Manasseh, Kabars, Khazars, and Benjamin had earlier left the southern continent, southern in the third century AD, along with the Naphtalites and the Kadarites from Kadar. Kadarites. Didn't we say before that Kadar with a C would just be cedar? Khan. Yeah. So Kadar City would just be. Cedar City, but with a hard K, it's Kadar. Got it. Let's go. Let's go. That's all we need to know about that. <laughs> all right. Oh, man. He traveled through the blue now. Oh, we're just talking Amara. <sighs> we all understand how much of a body bags are popping off right now. You know what I'm saying? David Rubani traveled for 10 days by land from Heber, Heber, Kavera to Kadar <laughs> or Cedar, Jeddah, like Judah. Kadar is Jeddah, like Judah, like Utah. Uh oh. <laughs> and then he sailed on the Indian Ocean, Red Sea, to Ethiopia, Africa, or come on now. Where's Ethiopia? He landed at a port in Tanzania, Zanzibar. Then he joined an Arab caravan going to the kingdom of Semnar, Sinar, Ethiopian Sheba. It was two months journey. The king was called Omar or Amar. And how much of a body bag is all this? He stayed with the king at his capital on the blue Nile, Aquatai. She's a genius. Because she was telling us about this Blue River, right? <laughs> the Blue River, right? 
tributary of the Red River in southern Oklahoma in the United States via the Red River is part of the watershed of the Mississippi River. Go get the drop from UB News. Uh, Chief Moray got some drop on it. Kurt Mayo got some drop on it. The Mississippi River has a very keen connection with the Nile. You're talking Blue Nile or you're talking Blue River or we're just back to the Copen drop, man. You know what I mean? But this Copenhagen drop is supposed to be in Mungersville, but Mungersville, they're just connecting it right over here to the Wisconsin River. But all this is connected, my nigga, to the Copen. <laughs> Ooh, moderate blue, that is a redder, redder color, because, yeah, it's the red flowing in with the blue. Blue, purple, red. Blue, purple, red. Via the Red River. That's why the red is going in. <laughs> Come on, man. Aqua Tai got the drive. We out of here. All right. And just very quickly, you know, when we talk Amara, just to kind of bring it to this whole you know, flow, you know what I mean? Ah, oh, man, this is so much drop. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, you're just talking tomorrow, you know what I mean, which connects a lot, a lot more than you would even imagine, you know what I'm saying? You see, Sodom and Gomorrah is Sodom and Amor, you know. So Lot lifted up his eyes and he examines all which is around the Jordan Valley. Because, you know, Abraham's like, man, which, which, what side you want, man? Because we, we got to go our separate ways, but wh where do you want? I'll, I'll go somewhere else. I'll go somewhere else, man. <laughs> so, you know, Lot lifted up his eyes. He, he saw all that's around the Jordan Valley. That all of it is well irrigated. That is before Hawa <laughs> destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Or Amor. Right? I'm just, I'm not making nothing up, man. The king there was called um uh, Okay, so we got this Egypt flow with this blue river. <laughs> it has blue now. We got Amora. And there's a king called Amora. I just want to keep that in mind, you know what I mean? Because. You know, you know, all these guys of Egypt been destroyed and you got this Sodom and Gomorrah that's been destroyed and Amor is Amor. It's spelled A-M-A-R-A -A -A or O-M-A-R-A. -A. Okay, so why destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, all right. Something about a garden enclosed as an enclosed garden. Lot does not have the benefit of the promises of God. He can only operate on human viewpoint. He cannot determine which way it is that he should go. This is it. Same way as, you know, <laughs> this is what we're dealing with. So the children of Lot. If Lot doesn't have the benefit of the promises of the creator, he's just rocking with Abraham, hoping to be Baruch, but he's not the seed of Abraham that gets that Baruch. Lot is not the seed of Abraham. This is why they're covetous towards your promises. He can only operate on human viewpoint. He cannot determine which way he should go, nor does he even seem to realize that God has a plan for his life also. He is used to taking the best, and that is what he will do. 
it is obvious that this area is much nicer than it was several centuries later during Joshua's time, after which some scholars allege that Genesis was written. Some scholars allege that Genesis was written during Joshua's time. Keep that in mind. This portion of the Jordan River was absolutely desolate. The antithesis, antithesis of the description given in this verse. It would make no sense for an author to make up the story like this when everyone during and after Joshua's day could see that this land was barren. Since that time, however, in the 19th and 20th centuries, archaeologists have shown that there were several populous cities in this area previous to Joshua's time for centuries, since, since it is highly unlikely that cities would be founded in a barren desert. This would fit with Abraham's description, which he gives there in his writing. So they're talking Joshua, which is going to lead us perfectly into talking Joshua right now. We're just talking, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. And just for kicks, man, uh, Gomorrah is a more. <laughs> Say it with me. Body back. Body back for the illusion because you're talking about a king over here. Name Amora or Amora or Amri. <laughs> Amora, king of Gomorrah. All right, we're just we're taking our time with it. <laughs> no time, only the way. Because you also have Amri and Israelite interested. Huh? But Amora. Is Gamor. All right, let's go. And Amor is Amor. <laughs> Which means love, right? Love in Spanish, but also can connect to these Amorites, right? Okay, let's go. Strong's Hebrew concordance. Yeah, man. Crazy stuff they say. This is crazy talk. Oh, they got Adama, Adama. Okay. Back it up. So you got Amri right next to Amora. That's interesting. What's that king got to do with it, huh? Amora, a ruined heap, right? So when you talk Amora, it's just like Atlantis, man, all over again, right? It's a heap of destruction after these dragons done burn it down. I mean, this is the bombing of Sodom and Gomorrah, Amora, by dragon fire. This is what we're talking about, boss. Amora, Amor. Sodom and Gomorrah has a lot more to do with Amor. Amora, am all right? Amor, <laughs> let's go. Interesting translation here. <laughs> you got the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizrahi. All right, let's just get down to it. The Canaanites was from Sidon or Sion or Sion or Sidon. As you go towards Gerar, as far as Azah, as you go towards Saddam, and Amor, right? So I'm just getting multiple witnesses that you drop that G, you know, they, they hide something, you know, this Amor business is hiding something. Let's keep going. You know, in the script, it would just be Sodom and Gomorrah, but everybody else is just saying Amor. 
Amor. <laughs> it's an interesting stuff, man, from the Indian news. They're talking about India over there, but in comparison, you know, you know, might want to do some contrasting with this. This is while Colonel Rowcroft remains at Amor, where he has had to repel another attack from the Belwa rebels. So there's an area in India over there, you know, which might correlate with over here. Uh, there's an area where, you know, they're going to war. <laughs> and Colonel Rowcraft, he remains at Amor. A Is this the same Gamor? Because Gamor seems to be correlating with Amor, right? So who's this Colonel Rollcroft about, man? Just, you know, stuff to dig on. Stuff to dig on. We we know that in Latin, amor means love. Amora. A known bearer is Brazilian Telenovia director. Okay, so somebody else's name, Amora. I'm just digging on it, you know, just digging on Amor. <laughs> they got some other Amor here, Portuguese flow. Taking me to Blackberries, okay. <laughs> but, you know, it is a name that's still used, and who would ever bring it and connect it with Gamora and Sodom and Gamora that's been, you know, blown to bits, you know, by these dragons called angels in their translations. Um, just a side note, something really interesting. You got this other name called Ismaria. You know what I'm saying? Ismaria got a lot to do with this uh, saint. Okay, but <laughs> let's read it. Ismaria, just side note, <laughs> let's put this to the side. We're talking Amazon Queens and, you know, High level aquas, all right? So quasi Marian name connected to the devotion of Notre Dame de Lisi in Picardy, according to the legend, is Maria, quote, the Black Madonna was a Moorish girl who converted to Christianity and released the Crusaders captivated or in captivity by her father. So her father, this Moorish girl, had these hijacks in captivity. She converts to Christianity and releases the hijack crusaders out of captivity that her father had a man because of some apparitions of Virgin Mary. Also associated with Saint Ismeria, I-S-E-I-S-M-E-R-I-A. Okay. Uh, obscure figure who dates back to the 12th century. <laughs> so this is right around this press to flow. She's a Moorish girl. What tribe is she from? I don't know, but they call her the Black Madonna. Yeah. And this is the same Black Madonna. Uh, you know, has something to do with the Pope, right? We still got a picture of her or something. Yep. Yep. Now, love the Horace Butler. He also connects this black Madonna because, you know, <laughs> the Pope is still paying obeisance to this black Madonna. You know what I'm saying? This ain't no play play. She's all over the place, right? So. Horace Butler has a connection between her and Sarah Kali, Black Khalifa. Sarah Kali supposedly is either the son of, they try to say she's the, um, or the daughter of JC, but she could be the daughter of Joshua. You know, this could be a situation where Joshua has a daughter, you know, named Kali. And is that the connection, you know, with Khalifa and Joshua and Moshe and this whole flow? You know what I'm saying? So, does Joshua have a daughter, and is that who they're venerating as the Black Madonna? 
that's just a side note, but let's go. Because <laughs> a lot is popping off, as you see. As you see, we're talking about the Moorish girl, right? 12th century. Okay, that's 1100s. Uh, this whole Colin O'Rourke craft situation, you know, the field force moved out at one and a half a.m., took up a position and formed little form line a little to the west of the village of Amora in our camp. When the bugle calls of the enemy were soon heard, and there something lines seen overlapping our flanks. So they're going to war in this Amora Gamora situation, but you know, it's just you know, they got this whole Amora on the map over there. It's kind of small and fuzzy, but it's right there. You can also dig on the Amorim. <laughs> All right. So these Amorim, according to ancient Jewish history, JewishVirtualLibrary.org, refers to scholars in the land of Israel and Babylon who succeeded the Tanaim. Remember the Tanaim and Tanis? Bring it back to the dragon or the jackal, but which one, right? And proceeded in Babylonia, the Savori or G Gianni. <laughs> now, does Gian love to love to uh, Templar Irvin Reed? Gian is also John, right? These Gianni probably have some John flow, John connection as well. You know, the more we dig on it, because you're still in the 12th, 13th century. You're talking Yaakov, pride of Jacob. Whoa. See, this is opening up a whole nother situation, man. This is opening up a whole nother situation, man. I'm just belly flopping, man. I'm just, you know, we keyed in right now because they got to keep coming back to King David, man. Moshe, Hashra, so. John is John. This is still Preston John flow. John means king, man. Let's go. Safar, Safarim. Still connects with that Safar, Safar, Safarim, Safarim. All this, man. Remember, uh, Safar, I believe, is also the brother of, uh, oh, no, no. It was uh, one of the lands that Jaktan's connected to. Safar, is that who it was? There we go, Safari, and they call it Safari. Right, right, right. We're just talking Kofin, right? <laughs> Blue River, Nile River. Let's go. So, along with this Amora, you got you got the Amarim, is what we're saying. And how does this connect to this whole Sodom and Gomorrah flow, the Amarim? You know what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm just bringing it up. You know, we're going to talk more on it. Don't, you know, <laughs> we're taking our time. Having heard that the Muhammad Hussein Hussein was occupying the neighboring village of Amor Ha or Amor in great force, Major Cox we've resolved to attack him. So now we're talking about the history of the Indian revolt and the expeditions to Persia, China by George Dodd. Okay. So there again, you know, this Amor is a place and it's a place, whether they're putting it in India here or India Superior, you know, this document called the American City Volumes 1 through 2, you know, has this Garden City of Amor situation <laughs> coming out of nowhere. And they compare it with the slums of Paris. So Paris is a slum, but Amor is a garden city. Is this the same Gomorrah, you know what I'm saying, in the Bible that was destroyed? Different places also named Amora or Gamora. Two places in Ethiopia, Sudan, Portugal, Papua New Guinea, which is interesting, right? You got India and Guiana, Guiana, or Guinea, Basau, which is connected back to the Indian flow as well. Yeah, that Papua New Guinea flow, you know what I mean, definitely seems to <laughs> have a, a breadcrumb or two for us to dig on, man. 
All right, all right. So talk a little more on you, man, and you can do some more recon yourself. A more eastern highlands in New Guinea. Okay. All right. We got highlands popping off. I mean, I like how we flow right now. Okay, so let's check this out right here. You know, you can't sleep on this Lake of Moor <laughs> situation that they're connecting with the Dead Sea, right? And we already know, love to the great work by uh, my bro, Chief Moray, as well as UB News, man. And this Dead Sea is connected with this great Salt Lake of Utah. Very similar flows, and, you know, they seem to be the same thing. Now, it says the first prehistoric lake to follow the Saddam Lagoon <laughs> is Lake Amore. And that's all code word for Sodom and Gomorrah. Saddam is Sodom. Amora is Gomorrah, right? We got that from the top. So, you know, don't let them, you know, throw you on no, no sidebars. You know what I'm saying? Like. It's right there in our face, ball. Amora, Gamora. Amora, Gamora. So when they bring up Sodom out of nowhere, don't don't trip. They now call it Saddam the Goon. <laughs> so it's like, damn, you know, these cities were destroyed where they just turned into lagoons, you know, rivers, lakes, uh, salt lakes, salty, you know, you got this lot situation with this pillar of salt, you know what I'm saying? You got to connect these salty, salty lakes. The two most salty you're going to get is what they call the Dead Sea over there and this Great Salt Lake in Udall, right? You got the Saddam Lagoon evaporates, mainly consisting of rock salt, eventually reaches thickness 2.3 kilo kilometers on the old, old basin floor in the area of today's Mount Sodom. Talking Sodom and Gomorrah. Then you got Lake Amor, followed by Lake Lasan, and finally by the Dead Sea. So the water levels of sol or salinity of the successive lakes Amora, Lasan, and Dead Sea have either risen or fallen as an effect of tectonic dropping of the valley bottom or some cataclysm like a uh, dragon fire, you know, and due to climate variations, as the climate became more arid, Lake Lasan finally shrank and became saltier, leaving the Dead Sea. So now the Dead Sea, which was Lake Lasan, <laughs> they want us to believe is the Dead Sea because it just suddenly shrank on a night, you know what I'm saying? Now, it's interesting, the Saddam Lagoon extended at its maximum from the Sea of Galilee. Now, watch how this correlates, man, with Utah. And, you know, <laughs> was it recently named these things or is it these things, all right? To somewhere around the 50 kilometer or 30 mile south of current southern end of Dead Sea. And the subsequent lakes never, the lakes never surpassed this expanse. The Hula Depression was never part of any of these water bodies due to its higher elevation and high threshold from the Kora Zim or Kara Zim block separating it from the Sea of Galilee Basin. So they're, you know, talking about what is now the valley of the Jordan River. Remember, Lot wanted this land, right? <laughs> All right, it was plentiful, right? Jordan River, Dead Sea, north of Wadi Araba, Araba, was repeatedly inundated by water from the Mediterranean Sea. Now, okay, we're talking Dead Sea. Now let's talk Great Salt Lake in northern Utah. Inland body, the largest inland body of salt lake water in the Western Hemisphere. Right? <laughs> and one of the most solid saline inland bodies of water in the world the lake is fed by the bear weber and jordan river so just like the dead sea it's fed by these same jordan river the lake has fluctuating great greatly in size depending on the rates of evaporation all right let's get it down here like the Dead Sea, so they compare it to the Dead Sea, right? Like the Dead Sea, the Great Salt Lake exists within an Arab environment 
an arid environment and has chemical characteristics similar to that of the oceans, much of the salinity than the oceans. However, since natural evaporation exceeds the, the supply of water from the rivers feeding the lake. So they're comparing it with the Dead Sea. You recon Udall's history and you got this Lake Bonneville, which was like a super lake, almost an ocean, you know what I'm saying? And they're saying that it was originally, you know, just like they said, it dried into the Dead Sea, that it was Lake Bonneville that pretty much dried into what's called the Great Salt Lake today, which was originally way bigger. It says Utah. It says the Great Salt Lake is the largest of the lake remnants of prehistoric freshwater Lake Bonneville, the others being Bear Lake and Utah-Idaho border on the Utah-Idaho border and Utah Lake west of Provo, Utah. Now, Utah Lake is also compared to the Galilee or Sea of Galilee. Formed in the Pleistine epoch 30,000 years ago, Lake Bonneville had high water covered almost 20,000 square miles of present day Western Utah. Imagine, just imagine the connectivity with all this water of present day Western Utah and also extended into modern Nevada and Idaho, man. So this is a huge lake. Hmm. It seems more biblical because it's way bigger than the Dead Sea, this Great Salt Lake. The Mormons settled in 1847 on their promised land <laughs> or our promised land on the nearby side of Salt Lake City brought the region more fully into national awareness. The lake was surveyed in 1850 and 1869 and the last spike of America's first transcontinental railroad was driven near the lake's northeastern shore. All right, so you got this Salt Lake popping off, you know, very, very similar, you know what I'm saying, to, you know, what is the Sea of Galilee. You know, they got different, you know, people talking about this Great Salt Lake. I'll leave a couple little blogs for you, but is the fact that the Great Salt Lake and Dead Sea are both hypersailing terminal lakes something Mormons have given any thought to? If so, it is just curiosity or did it have historic or scriptural influence, my life? So they have inscriptional influence or do they know, right? Mormon settles, settlers notice that a small freshwater lake to the south and large saltwater lake to the north with the river running between them was similar to the Holy Land with the Lake of Galilee fresh in the north and the Dead Sea in the south and the Jordan River connecting them. That is why they named the river connecting the two Utah lakes the Jordan River, or I think they first named it the West Jordan River. So, yeah, they connected the Sea of Galilee to this equation. The Sea of Galilee is the Utah Lake, my knock. Then you got the Jordan River and you got the Great Salt Lake or the Dead Sea. Yeah, because they declared this is the right place, right? It's unknown whether or not he knew about the River Jordan or the connections between the Dead Sea and the Great Salt Lake. However, it is clear that he was well aware of the prophecies from Isaiah that are repeated and referenced in the Book of Mormon. He will lift up an, an ensign to the nations from afar. Yeah. It shall come to pass in those days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come you and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. 
and we will walk in the paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Hawah from Jerusalem. That's Isaiah 2, chapter 2 through 3. <laughs> so did they just name these rivers or did they find the rivers? It's a great uh, article from the Church of Latter Day, <laughs> Latter Days, and they just are, they're making a comparison, man, not me. All right, so you got the the one over there, right? The Dead Sea, the tributary right here, the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee, right? But that same Sea of Galilee <laughs> is the Utah Lake. And that same Jordan River tributary is going into the Great Salt Lake. And you see the size difference between the Great Salt Lake and the Dead Sea, right? So this is the new Dead Sea. This is the OG of Dead Sea. Another Jordan River named after this, the stream in the Holy Land flows northward out of the Utah Lake. It travels about 30 miles to empty into Great Salt Lake. Great Salt Lake is much larger than the Dead Sea, and it's one of the natural wonders of the world. It is 75 miles long, <laughs> and in places, 50 miles wide. 50 miles wide, 75 miles long. The Dead Sea is only 48 miles long and a little more than nine miles wide. The Great Salt Lake is fed by other freshwater streams in addition to the Jordan River, but it is four to seven times saltier than the ocean. So, you know, I mean, when you look into all this Dead Sea business, you know, they connect it with this Sodom and this Gomorrah situation, right? This is what we got at top. I mean, they're looking for the promised land. <laughs> they got the Saddam Lagoon and the Lake Amora. And if the real Dead Sea is over here, then we got Sodom and Gomorrah over here. What does that got to do with Las Vegas? <laughs> but let's go, man, because many would call Las Vegas today Sodom, you know what I'm saying? So, all right, we got heavy salt popping off, pillars of salt, like Lot in them and Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So, you know, we got to connect this, you know, as we talk about this cube and this Moorish, you know, science temple popping off over here and during this Ice Age business and really connect, you know, what this Ice Age really is, you know, popping off all, you know, like, what's really happening with an Ice Age? And how's it connected to their technology in real time? I mean, in battle time. I mean, this Ice Age has everything to do with everything, whether they call it little or big, but, you know, just belly flop and making in our way to a dismount, I think we'll probably pick up on the Joshua flow coming in uh, hot, you know what I'm saying, for press to 94. And, uh, you know, definitely get back into the uh, Shintamani stone, get back into the Shambhala, press the flow. We definitely got to get back on the San Manyan and Lost Tribes and Promised Lands by uh, Ronald Sanders. This is right here that the San Manyan or the Sabaton, <laughs> was the volcanic strait that separated Australia from Asia. Okay. Right? Because we've been talking about this closeness and proximity. Australia is Antarctica. Asia, you know, would be all this. South America, North America. So, San Banyan might be right around Terra de Fuego, man, you know. <laughs> that's what we that's all we talking about i mean you know we're just trying to see clearly man in real time it's 
Samanya separates Australia from Asia. Volcanic strength. Okay. Because it said fire, right? It says this thing lights up into fire <laughs> uh, during the Sabbath. So it's called the Sabbath River. And you can't cross the Sabbath River on the Sabbath. And it keeps certain tribes exiled or maybe even protected. You know what I mean? So maybe we're still just talking Antarctica, but you know, it says the name of Saba is in the memory of this volcanic Sabaton Strait or River, Sabinya. While much of the northern Mu had already gone under the water in 535 AD, Ofer, all right, we're still talking Ofer, Joktan, right? Let's go. <laughs> and the cities of the south still existed even though the continent may have already been starting to dry up and become more desert-like. Scientists from the University of Western Australia claim that the Swan River, remember Swan Nights, the Barbars, let's go, once, once carried a huge volume of water and the weather in the past was much wetter. It was seen that some of the coastline of Western Australia may have fallen into the ocean around 535 AD, when a huge heavenly object struck Northern Australia and created the Dark Age. It's a heavenly object, we're talking a dragon, <laughs> turned Europe into the Dark Ages, man. Anywhere you belly flop on this <laughs> document right here is, is a good place, man. Whether you're talking Davidic kings connected back to Australia, you know, this is all stuff that we got to take our time with, man. Um, you know, I'm just digging on this Ice Age business, man. Little Ice Age business, man. You know, big Ice Age business. Either way, it's big business. Because it's changed everything drastically. Cataclysms. Recent cataclysms. Many Ice Age, they call it. What do they say caused the many Ice Age? Let's see. Yeah, man, they say many ice age. First, they were talking about the big ice age. Now they said many, right? So let's go. Earlier in the great catastrophe, about 535 AD, where two celestial objects hit the Gulf of Carpentaria, north of Australia. Carpentaria, okay. Parts of the coastline sunk in Australia, much land sunk under the water east of Australia, leaving mainly New Zealand behind and causing the mini ice age in the North Hemisphere, which destroyed the Altharian Empire. What? We're talking David. And sunk the Altharian Island, kingdoms of Lyonese, southwest of Cornwall, Loch Lane, and all this always comes up, Ireland. Okay. The Dutch ships are the ships of Zebula. Okay. Then it went back into around 700 to 500 BC. A further time of catastrophe occurred in which much of Southeast Asia or Sunderland went underwater and a portion of the fleeing lost Israelites settled in Australia from the Davidic kingdom of Qadar. <laughs> Are we talking about the kingdom of Cedar or the kingdom of Qadar? In Southwest Western Australia, an exodus of the Mu or Ma. <laughs> Shout out to the bro, five eyes, what they do. Moved to Asia Minor and Egypt. So this is when they move over there to Asia Minor. All right. Let's keep going. We in belly flop mode right now, man. Yeah. So they're breaking down what they want to call <laughs> an alternate history of Australia. And I mean, I just love that they are touching, you know, on different areas of the investigation, man, whether they're talking ice ages or swans, you know what I'm saying? Whether they're talking moo 
the kingdom of Heber, Eber, or Kaver, the city of Kedar, or Cedar City, <laughs> uh, southwest of Ophir, all right? I mean, my nag is that no, no. You know, that's all we got to say about that. Then they got the river of Sheba, which is also Thebes. Land of Eber, which we know is Kavera. Yeah, I mean, and take your time with this because we're going to come back and take our time with it for show, man. Because then they go into the Ice Age of Year, 1500 BC. Hey, allow a However, these lost Israelites were actually the remnant of the kingdom of Eber. Kabera, Kaba, Kabera. Heva, like my boy Tao in the cities of Go, Heva is Eber. Sheba, let's go, Khalifa flow. Talking move, my knock. I am David, the son of King Solomon. May the memory of the righteous be for a blessing. Remember, we got this flowing genie where you got Prester, father of Solomon the first. And this solely title is already applied to the Presta, you know what I mean? So this title goes back before Presta, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, so they're all solely minds, you know what I mean? Interesting, man, let's get it. I am David, the son of King Solomon. May the memory of the righteous be for blessing, and my brother is King Joseph, who is older than I and who sits on the throne of his kingdom in the wilderness of Habal, or Eber, or Kaber, and rules over 30 myriads of the tribe of God and the tribe of Reuben, right? Rubadi, Gadi, Manasseh, and of the half-tribe of Manasseh. I have journeyed from before the king, my brother and his counselors, the 70 elders, they charged me to go first to Rome to the presence of the Pope. May his glory be exalted. I left them by the way of the hills, 10 days journey. This is where he picked up with this Amara business or Gamara business. So Reuben, Rubadi, Rubini traveled 10 days by land from Eber to Kadar, right? This is what we got. Like I said, I'm doing a super belly flop because you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not even like 10% into what I wanted to get into, but you know, this is what the presser flow has always been for us, you know. There's always so much to continue with, which to have so much more to go at 93, going into 94, you know, all praise of what. That's all we could say. Yeah, we got so much more to go after 93 installments of Preston John. We got to get on this kingdom of Eber, right? Because that is Kivera on the map. The Polynesians tell of a story of a sunken homeland with seven cities of Go'o called Ever, Hever. This is where Tao's from, the Heva people, right? He says the Heva people, the cities of Go, which is the kingdom of Heber. Wow, let's go, man. Hey, this is a victory lap, man. Oh, we're back to Jock Ta. 
the Kenites intermarry with the black descendants of Joktan. <laughs> so <laughs> make no mistake about Joktan and him, man. <laughs> He's as full blown Nagas. Let's go. Queens of Rhoda, back to Afghan, you know, Jeremiah Flo. I just want you, you know, just point out these names so you just see it coming over and over again, no matter what. These Davidic kings, the name Da coming from David, Da Wee, Da Woo. Some of the Afghans in Australia, right? We got that at the top. 19th century returning remnants from the tribes who left in the 16th century for Afghanistan. And they want to put Pakistan. Oh, the white aboriginals. A pass for Afghan. Stop it. We just <laughs> we already know what time it is with Jeremiah in there. So do David or his grandfather, King Solu Mik Solima. Okay. <laughs> Told y'all when you hear my drop is popping off, man. I, I took it as far as I can go into the top of the soul. It's flapjack season, man. <laughs> it's time to make some flapjacks. But let me try to just get a few more things, man, because you know, I want to make sure we come in at 94 hot, man. Yeah. All right. Let's just, you know, we're talking Little Ice Age, right? So at this time, at the lands of the Karagulan Plateau, we're in warm climate. We also have the north coast of Antarctica on a map of 15. 13, the Perry Reese map. We got this last time. Free of ice. Get the drops, man. I'm going fast. It was seen that the most recently of as the Middle Ages, Antarctica was free of ice. No ice on it. How many witnesses have we got that Antarctica's free of ice? Man, we got maps, cartographers, man. We got these documents popping out of everywhere. It would seem that the temperature in this part of the world changed around the same time as the little ice age descending on europe well we know that that was primarily popping off in america and they say one of the causes is the european contact and all the you know uh massive descent or uh, decline you know in human population or the indigenous population was declining all the killing all the more and more war all the treaties and of course, the mountain of harmonics, <laughs> all causing these little ice age. They said a meteor, everything's happening, right? It's all happening, huh? Antarctica became covered with, with ice. This is after the 1500s, man. So, what's really there? At this time, huge tsunamis hit the west and southeast coast of Australia and many lands sunk into the ocean. What events happened? in the Southern Hemisphere to trigger these events. Yeah, they keep talking about King Arthur, huh? <laughs> yeah, the whole ecosystem is changing. This led to the mini ice age, man, in Europe and at the end of the Arthurian kingdom. Stop it. 534 AD, the Chinese astronomers saw Mars <laughs> In the constellation known as King Arthur's Chariot, the Big Dipper in Britain, and King David's Chariot in Ireland. Say it with me. Body back for the illusion. King David's Chariot is King Arthur's Chariot, letting you know that they're mimicking the King David history into Arthurian history, creating a false genealogy under this Joffrey of Monmouth. And the Big Dipper is King David's chariot. Got nothing to do with Orion's belt, man. It's King David's chariot. The Big Dipper is the Prestor's chariot. So King Arthur's chariot is the Big Dipper. That is King David's chariot. God, and all this has to do with this Little Ice Age, it says the Kerrigulin Plateau Islands were still above water in the 1280s when Marco Polo visited and they may have been destroyed 
and sunk in 1350. And this may have triggered the Little Ice Age and the freezing of all of Antarctica, my nigga. <laughs> I'm not saying it. They saying it. Yeah. So this little ice age ain't really so little if it's freezing all of Antarctica, huh? <laughs> if all the ice wall was formed at this time, this is a major spell going on, major curse of these beautiful lands. You know, we know it's coming, you know, directly from Hawaii, you know what I mean? But at the same time, is it being also manipulated, you know, by these other powers? moving with permission of the pharaoh we ain't gonna let our foot off the neck bone of hijack city we're gonna come right back in and talk about the joshua flow you know leading into you know all of this uh separation the casting of lots you know what i'm saying and you know everything else i mean we, we got <laughs> we gonna talk Antion. we still got a whole flow to dig on Antion. i've been flirting with man so you know again they're saying that Whatever happened, right? This destroying, this sinking, these islands, with the, you know, Marco Polo visited. It may have been destroyed and sunk in 1350, all right? And have triggered this little ice age. So kind of like Atlantis sinking. And this is why there's no cap on Antarctica's chest bone. Or it may have occurred in 1530, as scientists are still disagreeing about when this little ice age began. So they don't even know. They can't even tell you when it actually popped off. I mean, when did Sodom and Gomorrah popped off? Remember, you got a Amora in uh, New Guinea. Remember that? <laughs> okay. All connected, man. All connected to this drought. It is possible that it is possible that the Australian Aborigines came from the island of Nukarviran and its sister island, which has survived being sunk in 1350 AD, but instead sunk in 1530. See how they flipped these? All they did was flip the five and the three. 1350 to 1530. If this is so, then it would most likely demonstrate that the Little Ice Age began in 1530 rather than 1350 as these natives were naked <laughs> this would also demonstrate that 1513 perry reese map showing the northern coast of antarctica without ice was from recent sources man we digging on antarctica the ice age freeze over surfing the wave in real time and putting our story together by Naga, because the list, little ice age uh, triggered the freezing of all Antarctica. So this little ice age can't be so little. And again, they're saying that several causes have been proposed. Black death of Europe, mm, plague, huh? Hawaii's plague, huh? The epidemics emerging in the Americas upon European contact, treaties, more and more war caused the ice age that caused the ice wall of Antarctica or <laughs> Australia's Monaga. This has been the 93rd installment of the Preston John investigation. Continue to surf the wave. We're coming in high with Annie and our Joshua flow and uh, continuing to connect our story in real time, man, like only we can. Talking Terra Fuego and the San Banyan River. Oh boy, it's all happening. It's all happening. Hey, Shalom to the tribe. I'm coming in high. Hey, for a while. A loud while. Yeah, man. Hi, Amazon Queens. <laughs> Cons of Kalelu, stand up. Nagaville, 
We on Coom Coom. We'll also be talking that Daniel L. Coom EC connected with the non Ben David. You dig? Press the 94 coming in high. Shall a wham to the tribe. Stay up. Suit up. Choose up. A wah.